Is the U.S. economy finally cooling? While it will take several months of data to answer that question, one key piece of the puzzle comes with the closely watched employment report. Here with more on this now is our chief equity strategist and economist, John Blank. John, we, we've had one employment report recently in early June. Did that help answer this question? No, it didn't, Terry. Uh, and also, we're seeing latest unemployment claims fall uh, for off a of high. So it does look like we're, we're trending upwards in the unemployment rate for households to 4%. But the underlying benefits and claims numbers are not suggesting it's getting out of control. So the Fed wants and welcomes some of the higher levels of household unemployment in the United States. It's trying to cause that with their higher rate environment. Uh, they just don't want to get out of control and be disorderly. And, and at this point in time, Terry, speaking on June the 27th, 2024, there's no evidence of a disorderly, unwanted labor market whatsoever. We're going to have another employment report come out on Friday, July 5th. Do you expect that to provide any further clarity to this question? Uh, it's going to take us up in numbers, Terry. We know that the weekly unemployment claims are kind of a leading indicator of the monthly non-farm payrolls. That makes sense, right? People flying less claims mean more jobs. So it's not going to happen in July the 5th that we're going to get a, a non-farm payroll report to, to, to really spark, spark our reaction to this market, if, if you're a betting person, uh, I would not bet on that. We've seen a lot of other economic data out recently. Does all of that support a cooling scenario? Well, Terry, today, again, talking June the 27th, we got the, the third and final Q1 GDP that came in at 1.4%. Um, if you're worried about that, we're also at the end of the second quarter and the GDP non numbers, which when they get to the end of a quarter, uh, they have incorporated the bulk of the data that underpins the assessment. So a GDP now in the early part of the second quarter should be discarded. One in the late part of the quarter should be a, you know, a t taken seriously, and it's a 3%, Terry. So a 3% growth rate for real GDP in the United States is, is an expanding economy above trend. That means be, you keep that in mind. The main economic event, though, has investors looking ahead to tomorrow, uh, June 28th's PCE report, for clues about possible Federal Reserve rate cuts. Are you hopeful for a rate cut this year at all? I think, you know, it's really not going to be as much about the PCE numbers tomorrow unless they're really out of line, of course, uh, as it will be with the Fed staying in, in alignment with uh, conditions of monetary policy cuts in Europe and Canada and Japan and Latin America. Uh, this time around in the monetary easing cycle, uh, the Fed is not leading, Terry, it's lagging. And they, they, we have a yen at 160, which is a multi decade high depreciation of the yen, largely because of their stalling on rate, you know, rate sideways rate motion. So I think they are talking to their counterparts internationally, and they're likely to do a SEPTIS cut to put them more in alignment with the ECB, particularly in Japan and the Swiss Bank in Canada also. Here's something else that I saw that was interesting. We saw consumer spending soften a bit in April and retail sales increasing less than expected in May. Does that indicate lackluster GDP growth going forward? No, Terry, I think it, it indicates the one headwind within the U.S. consumer's economy and the two tailwinds. Uh, I mean, they're meaning right now we have, you know, 20 to 25 percent higher prices of food at home, food away from home and the broad, broader spectrum of consumer staples that you might encounter at a Costco or Walmart or Target. Uh, and that, you know, for the, for, the, for the consumer living on a fixed uh, monthly income, that's, you know, that's a salient number. That's a real situation. However, there's two headwinds that are also going up, those who have stock market wealth and are retired, and those who have a home who, who have seen record highs in, in their price of that home. So, discretionary spending, we're seeing it in carnival cruises and things like that, uh, is doing quite well. And they're seeing record numbers and record bookings. So again, I think, you know, netting it out is giving you the consumer spending number, but within that, there is these three stories, two of which are bullish and one of which is very bearish. You view the housing market as a key economic indicator. So first we had a lack of inventory. But now published data shows home listings starting to rise, but the home buyers are slow to show up. 
So is higher for longer rates choking off demand? And if so, how concerning is that? Well, Terry, what's happening, people, a lot of people locked in a 30-year fixed mortgage during the COVID period at record lows. So they don't want to let those mortgages go. And they certainly don't want to move. So that keeps the inventory number down. And then the buy side of it, all an 8% mortgage, let's keep that as our template for the 30-year fixed rate. It does move, but that's where it's been centered at. Um, versus a three and a half percent mortgage it's a totally different world for a buyer now versus a seller so the covid fed decisions um have driven a wedge between the buyers and sellers and that wedge is you know declining terry towards a place where the market can clear but for strong clearing in a market like this uh it will take years i would say 2026 is probably a good place to look for a lot of clearing in housing where then are the bright spots in the macroeconomic landscape currently? Well, I think the consumer and the strong, tight job market um, and the, the, the slow recession in the overall consumer inflation rate that lifts real wages slightly above, you know, uh, into, into a positive place is, you know, going to keep the economy at trend. And it's, you know, at a 4% unemployment rate, we're already at a long-term trend. So if we can keep the U.S. economy at a long-term trend, decelerated from last year, but still still high and along the long-term trend, that that would be the driver, I think, that, that keeps this economy going. All right, let's explore three hot infotech sector stocks, GE Aerospace, Arista Networks, and Tokyo Election. Tokyo Electron, Terry. Um, first of all, GE Aerospace is the spinoff of GE, and it's basically um, containing the growth stocks and and in that company, and that is being lifted by the plane travel that it, the world is experiencing, not only in the United States but in China and Europe. And this is a wholly positive thing for an aircraft engine maker. So GE Aerospace got to like it, and it does get a bit. At Arista Networks for the last five years has been a number one ranked stock almost consistently. The chart is absolutely special, 42% gain this year, year to date. And why? Because Arista Networks is engaged in providing cloud networking solutions for data centers and cloud computing environments. Let's repeat that, Terry, so people understand what's going on. Anything attached to this business is doing extremely well and it is the new, new backbone of Infotech. Arista Networks is engaged in providing cloud networking solutions for data centers and cloud computing environments. And I'll leave it there. And I have my head in the clouds a lot most days, but that's beside the point. <laughs> yeah, and the third one, Terry, is Tokyo Electron. Um, Tokyo Electron is mainly engaged in the manufacturing and sale of electronic products for industrial uses. So this is a chip maker in Japan. It's, in, it's the largest, one of the largest in Japan, the third largest in the world. I mean, we, we often heard of Taiwan Semi and not T-O-E-L-Y, but it is a strong stock to know about. Having said that, we got a forward PE at 38 on a stock like this. So it does, uh, you know, behoove oneself to consider that, you know, the, the rally in the chip stocks is probably reaching a point where it might truly roll over. So T-O-E-L-L-Y, we're at a number three rank right now, but you know, year to date change is 24% gain. That's above the S&P 500 Terry. So you gotta like a stock like this on the momentum. All right, our chief equity strategist and economist, John Blank on the US economy. With John, I'm Terry Ruffalo. Check this out. Zach's insider trader finds stocks so strong that company officers are pouring their own money into them. That's interesting. You're invited to follow this portfolio's buys and sells in real time for the next 30 days by going to zax.com slash promo for details. This material is being provided for informational purposes only, and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice, or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax, or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create, and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identified and described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's investment research as a whole.